Today I'm joined by Supervisor Katrina Foley and leaders of BeWell, including Marshall Reek Moncrief, who is CEO of the BeWell and also OC Mind, and Dr. Veronica Kelly, our Chief of Mental Health and Recovery Services at the Orange County Health Agency, and Lieutenant Michael Hines, who is a Fullerton Police Department homeless liaison officer and also is the commander of the Orange County SWAT team. We're hosting our press conference today at the Be Well Orange Campus to provide you with a Be Well and COVID-19 update. This facility serves as a treatment center for mental health and substance use disorders for all residents in Orange County, regardless of ability to pay. Treatment is offered as part of an integrated support system. Be Well is a true public-private partnership and investors in the facility include the County of Orange, Cal Optima, Kaiser Permanente, Hogue Hospital, and Providence, which includes St. Jude Medical Center and St. Jude Hospital, St. Joseph Hospital. But a little over a year since Be Well first opened, so we, are one, so we wanted to speak to the experts and hear how the Be Well campus has revolutionized mental and behavioral health in Orange County and how our residents may receive services. Finally, our healthcare officer and director of healthcare agency, Dr. Chow, provide a COVID-19 update, and then we'll take questions from the media. So again, thank you for being here today. And I, before we start up, I'd ask my colleague, Supervisor Karina Foley, if she'd like to say a few words. Supervisor. Thank Foley. you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you for hosting this important press conference today. Uh, good afternoon. I'm Katrina Foley, your Orange County Supervisor, and I want to take, thank our media partners for being willing to share this great information that we have about our Be Well Center, about homelessness, uh, about our addiction treatment services, and, of course, our COVID update. We continue to face a homelessness crisis here in Orange County, health, mental health crisis, and addiction. The problem only got worse during the COVID-19 pandemic. You'll hear some good news today from Dr. Chow about our status of our COVID-19, uh, the lifting of some restrictions, including masks. And we also will hear from our experts here to talk about what services the county has uh, been providing for our most vulnerable residents. These impacts are long overdue and are, are impacting our overall quality of life of our community. Across the state and the county, we are seeing encampments that need to be cleared. We are struggling to provide housing for people. And I'm happy to report that this week, the state of California granted the county a $3.6 million grant to remove encampments in the Talbert Park in Costa Mesa. That was a project that I long worked on as the mayor of Costa Mesa. And so what's great about that project is that we will be able to remove the encampment, restore the park to its natural habitat, and also provide a regular staff member there on a regular basis so that the encampment doesn't come back. Most importantly, we will house 60 individuals with that state grant. So we're really pleased about that. Also this week, uh, the chairman will be joining me in a fentanyl hearing. We will be hosting a fentanyl hearing at our Hall of Administration. We will have experts such as Sheriff Don Barnes, Assembly Member Cotty Petrie Norris, Dr. Chow, our new Behavioral Health Director, Dr. Veronica Kelly, and welcome to the team, um, as well as our District Attorney and Costa Mesa Police Chief, Ron Lawrence others as well to talk about the current fentanyl crisis as it relates to Orange County and to listen to recommendations for how we can improve for our future. This is very personal to me. I have a friend who's a mom who lost her son and his girlfriend because they used a Xanax bar that was laced with fentanyl and she found them embraced together dead in the morning. So this crisis is personal to many of us and we must do something about it. Part of that solution is right here at the Be Well Center where the Board of Supervisors has set an ambitious goal to treat mentally ill patients as well as to provide good addiction treatment services to get people out of the jails for sobering and into a treatment facility. We also know that treatment by professional medical staff as opposed to 
in neighborhoods in uns with unscrupulous sober living home operators is preferable for Orange County. So I'm excited to be here and hear from our guest speakers here and to share with our community all of the good that we are doing here in the County of Orange for addiction treatment and mental health services. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Supervisor Foley. I'd like to start with CEO Marshall Moncrief. I'd like you to kind of bring us from where we started and why did we do Be Well, what were the needs of the community, and how do we come into existence? Okay. Well, thank you, and uh, thanks, everybody, for being here. And um, we have our, our brave uh, public health officer here, and so um, I'm inclined to mention first that uh, while we're in this treatment facility, uh, active with patients in care, we are in a special part of the facility that we created just for events like this, so we're not disrupting patients or putting anyone at risk in being unmasked and able to have a communication like this. So thanks for coming and thanks for being here. And we're all vaccinated. And we're all vaccinated <laughs> and <Very> boosted. <laughs> um, so thank you. Um, and thanks for the question. You know, um, Orange County has long been known for world-class health care. And so if it's cancer care, uh, orthopedics, heart and vascular, women's care, um, we have some of the best facilities and best providers anywhere on the planet. Um, right here in Orange County. When it comes to mental health and substance use treatment, um, we have good services and programs, but we don't have a system. And so for people that are seeking care, finding care, connecting to care is like navigating a maze. Now, it's very difficult and very painful. And to build on some of Supervisor Foley's comments, the crises of mental health, substance use, related challenges of suicide and homelessness, all of those were each individually considered epidemic levels before COVID. COVID came in and put gas on the fuel of those challenges. And so if there were ever a time where we need to rally together to create a system response to the mental health and substance use needs of the community, this is it. So Be Well, in response to your question, is a community-wide effort to bring us all together to create a system response to mental health substance use and related challenges. I think you touched on this a little bit, but how is Be Well transforming the mental health system? How was it before and how are you different today? Yeah, I think what, what Be Well has succeeded in so far and we continue to evolve together is bringing, um, bringing together partners that hadn't historically worked well together. Mm -hmm. And so all of the partners at Be Well have long been doing an excellent job at programs and services, but they've been disconnected from one another. Mm. And so Be Well has created a platform, a place, for all of those partners to come together and lock arms more intentionally. And so some of you may have heard and some of you may not have heard, Be Well is created up of all of the non-for-profit hospitals, the County of Orange Healthcare Agency, CalOptima, the Medicaid plan, the faith community, all of the universities, private business. So this really is kind of the stone soup model of creating a mental health system of care. Everybody has something to contribute, a resource, a specialty, and we're coming together to make collective impact uh, in doing this together. So that is a difference where we've all come together before. We were kind of separated, maybe in our own little silo. Exactly. And now we've come out of those silos to do the, a better job. That's exactly right. I mean, let's look at the horizon. Uh, I, I think you since opening almost been a capacity here. What's on the horizon for Be Well? Are there plans underway for, let's say, a second campus in Orange County? And if so, how are those services different from what you have here? Yeah, thanks for the question. Um, two responses come up for me. Uh, and I'll keep them short, Chair, Chair Chafee. But one is, is we want the community to think of Be Well as more than just a facility mm -hmm. or a place. We want the community to think of Be Well as a collaborative, a community-wide collaborative that's bringing together a system of mental health. Within that system, we need facilities of care, and this is the first facility of care. Mm -hmm. And so um, right now we're treating, uh, we have 93 beds active in this facility. Um, law enforcement is accessing this facility. Hospitals are active accessing this facility, and um, residents of Orange County. Largely those services, though, are centered around adults with a small service for adolescents. And so in second and third campuses that come online, 
We have a real expressed interest and intention and commitment to make sure services are available across the lifespan. And so that's the biggest need, is to make sure that we're available for the entire community, regardless of their payer status, regardless of their age, and regardless of their insurance. And that's a continued commitment of, of BYU Orange County. Will this in new facility that's looking at be larger than this one? It will be larger than this one. So the facility you're in now is two and a half acres. It's 60,000 square feet and it houses seven different services. Mm -hmm. uh, a future facility, we're looking at a property that is multiples in size, allowing a much broader uh, scope of okay. services. Yeah. That, that's terrific that yep. you're doing there. And then there may be an additional campus beyond that, depending on the needs of the county. I going to reach so. everyone if we can. Yeah, I think so. It needs to be accessible for patients mm -hmm. and families wherever they live in the community. So we need to be very strategic about where these are placed um, so they're ex accessible. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's great. Uh, Supervisor Foley, you may have a few questions for uh, Dr. Kelly. Yes, yeah, so thank you, Marshall. We've come a long way. I mean, I know <laughs> you and I uh, went on a field trip to San Antonio yes. when we were first having these conversations about this system of care. Yeah. And it's great to see that it's actually in fruition now helping residents of Orange County. And I think what's important about what uh, your conversation with Chairman Chafee was, is that it is free for Orange County residents uh, and that we will have access for Orange County residents. Um, Dr. Veronica Kelly, great to have you. Um, she's our Chief Mental Health and Recovery Services uh, Director for the Orange County Healthcare Agency. And I remember on our call when I uh, got to interview you prior to you taking the position, we talked a lot about why uh, addiction treatment services and mental health services are so important to you. And you know, my work has been to uh, really root out unscrupulous uh, separate living home operators, detox operators that are just mills that try to hurt uh, individuals and push them out onto the street as opposed to treating them and helping them to stabilize. So tell us what this program here, which is one of the things I love about the, the Be Well Center, is that they have a residential treatment professional medical care for detox and for addiction treatment. So tell us about um, how is this going to support the overall health of Orange County? That is a great question, Supervisor, and it's good to see you as well. Um, Be well. This campus is different than anything we've seen in the state of California, so it's very exciting to be here. There are four levels of care for substance use disorder in one facility, in one building, and that doesn't happen in the greater sphere of California. It's all over the place. So think about how you get your own physical health care. You go to your doctor that might be on Huntington Beach, and then you go get your labs in Garden Grove, and then you have to go to Westminster to see your specialist. And that's difficult for those of us who don't have a mental illness and for those of us who don't have an addiction. So we wanted to make sure that people could access appropriate level of care here, such that if someone comes in here, and law enforcement brings them because they found them um, under the influence of substances, they could bring them in here to the sobering center and they can have an opportunity to sober up. But during that time, a clinician, an alcohol and drug counselor, will talk to the person in that small window of time where we can offer them treatment and then they could accept it. And then to your point, we could offer them withdrawal management because maybe they don't want to be dope sick. It's difficult to come off of these substances, but we can do it safely and monitor them. And then if they needed a higher level of care like residential, it's right here. We can just shift them over and they can get their recovery. And during that time, if we find that perhaps underlying that addiction is a major depressive disorder, we've got that here too so we can serve them and attend to their mental illness as well as their addiction at the same time. In addition, we have crisis stabilization, which is a fancy way for talking about urgent care. That's what it is. So think about how on the weekend you might be preparing for a barbecue and you might slice your finger with a knife. Instead of going to the emergency department that will take hours, you wanna go to the urgent care in your neighborhood. It's in your neighborhood, it's close, you trust it. That's what this is so that adults can come here and get their urgent care for their psychiatric issues, and it's short stay, it's under 24 hours. But if they need higher level of care, they go into the crisis residential, 
which will still attend to their mental health crisis, but it allows them to receive treatment, stabilize, and we have up to 90 days where we can serve them because what we don't want is to discharge people into the streets. Right, and that's a big part of this program is that uh, the center here is a good neighbor. Um, I think that's the a key difference between some of what's happening in our communities in our neighborhoods. Um, can you talk a little bit about the model that we have here and how this could be a model, not just for Orange County, but for the state of California? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I previously was the behavioral health director in San Bernardino County, and we've been watching this. They've been watching this, a correction. <laughs> because this really, if you talk to anyone at the state, at the governor's office, they're looking, but also our neighbors. So Arizona, Nevada, even though we've taken some of their ideas, we're perfecting it in a different way because we're bringing forward the public health system so that we are leveraging Medi-Cal dollars and the Medi-Cal expertise that we have in delivering specialty mental health. We are leveraging Mental Health Services Act dollars here, philanthropy, as well as um, our CalOptima, our health, our health program here. So it is everyone coming to the table because what we know is if you're not at the table you're on the menu and so we want everyone here this as Marshall stated is not just a facility it's a philosophy about wellness for all residents of Orange County that's great and you know I know that we're going to hear from uh, Lieutenant Hines here um, but when we visited in S San Antonio one of the highlights I think was this sobering station mm -hmm. and I know the chairman has some questions for Lieutenant Hines um, Whenever we can keep people from going to jail um, and have them a, a healthy place to sober up, I think that's a good thing. Chairman? Oh, well, it sure is. Uh, but before we leave, uh, Marshall or uh, Veronica, I'll ask you a question. If a resident is in a crisis, how did they get here? How did they get the services? We've talked about what you are, but these services are intended to be free for all Orange County residents. How do they access the services that you provide? That's a great question. Yeah, so the, the services, because of the partnership that created this, were able to make the services available to anybody with any payer. And so if they have private insurance or they have Medicaid, um, or maybe the person is struggling with homelessness and might not have insurance, because of the partnership that put this together, we're able to take anybody under any of those payer conditions. Most of the people are arriving today, if they're in crisis, by way of law enforcement or EMS. We have a lot of referrals from local emergency departments where people just are not getting good care because the emergency department wasn't designed for this type of crisis. And so um, a lot of crises are coming in that way. We are creating an admissions team right now okay. for the larger community. Uh, so when they have a need, they can phone in be assessed mm -hmm. and, um, and access care that way. Can I ask a follow-up? Because, you know, we do have, like, Hogue Hospital has a, a residential treatment program. Yes. And you and I have talked about the differences and why that's less accessible for some than the Be Well Center. So can you tell us about how those are different? Yeah, and so um, Ronnie was kind of uh, talking about this a little bit with the geographic dislocation of health care. So you go to Garden Grove for this, and then you get bounced to Westminster for that and around town. Well, the same um, fragmentation happens with payer status. And so I'm in desperate need of care for my 20-year-old daughter who's struggling with a substance use problem. I just found a needle in her room, and I'm scared out of my mind. And so I'm Googling for places to go. Already that's bad. <laughs> yeah. Because what do I know as an uninformed parent what's going to be good on a Google search or not? And then I begin my calling, and I call the first location that says, oh, gosh, what's your insurance? You know, we only take Medicaid here. Oh, well, I have an Aetna plan. So I go down the list, and I call another one. Oh, you know, we're not contracted with Aetna either. But if you have a Cigna PPO plan, and the list goes on and on. And so what we've created here is a one-stop shop that no matter what's in your back pocket, including potentially nothing, we're going to come together as a community and make sure we hug into care. And so that's the difference, is we can treat across clinical diagnoses like Ronnie was describing, across different clinical needs and different levels of care, and across different payer statuses. And that's the win. That's the differentiator. Thanks. Yeah. So we are developing an intake system 
that doesn't necessarily go through other providers where somebody's in crisis, they can call? And do they self-admit, or how do we take care of that? You know, Chair, that, that piece is an ongoing evolution. Okay. And so because uh, this is the first of its kind in the state, like Dr. Kelly called out, yeah. we've been really methodical about how we open this okay. to an expanded circle of the community. Okay. So it's been very intentional that for the first run of this facility, we've had access for law enforcement, for hospitals, uh -huh. for the county health care system, mm -hmm. um, and, uh, and, and, and others. And as, as we continue to grow, that circle will, will widen out. Okay, yeah. that, that's great. And so we have another campus that will be an automatic expansion of the Ex service. Exactly. All right. Uh, Lieutenant Hines, I'd like to thank you for coming in today. I understand this is your day off. Yes, sir. Thank you for inviting me. That's my pleasure. <laughs> Well, you've been working with Be Well in a couple of capacities. One is we call our sobering station, as well as bringing some mental health uh, people that need that kind of care here. Would you describe how uh, the sobering station works and what that's all about? Absolutely. We uh, will generate a call for service. Either it's a self-initiated call or it's a radio call for service. It will go out and make contact with people in the public. Um, usually it's an addiction issue or it's a uh, public intoxication issue. Um, a lot of the times when we get these calls, it's the habitual offenders, the people that have the addiction problems that, that we've arrested several times over the past you know, several weeks or months or years. Um, this program is ideal for them because instead of just going to a jail cell and having them sober up for eight hours and give them a citation and, and kick them out the back door, mm -hmm. This actually has the resources to give them, you know, a, a potential addiction resources in the future and to help them in the future. Um, our jail doesn't have that capacity. We can keep them there and then we release them. And a lot of times what happens is when we release them eight hours later, six hours after they're released, you see them back on the streets inebriated again. Mm -hmm. And we get another call for service because they're causing problems or, or what have you. Mm -hmm. and, it, and it's a revolving door. This program here is one of the first I've ever experienced where mm -hmm. there are resources and we don't see them six hours after we release them. Um, on several occasions, we've had people that, that have used the services here that we never see again. We never get calls for service again. Or it, you know, someone who's a habitual, everyday offender, we mm -hmm. don't see them for weeks at a time. Um, mm -hmm. So this program is perfect and ideal mm -hmm. for law enforcement. How would you compare booking one of these individuals in the jail versus bringing them here? The main difference is time and resources, I, as I previously stated. But when it comes to time, let me give you a, just a, a layout. Officer goes out in the field because they get a call if somebody who's drunk in public, uh, whether or not it be a transient or a uh, downtown bar patron, whoever it is. Uh, we go out there and make contact with the person. If we're going to go the jail route, we take them back to the jail. It usually takes about an hour to, to book and process a person before they're even placed in a cell. So they'll be in our sally port. They'll go through the triage program. They'll go through the, the booking, the photographing, the fingerprinting. Then they'll put in a, a silvering station or I'm, I'm sorry, sobering cell. Um, generally speaking, depending on their level of intoxication, we usually keep them for about eight hours until they, they're, they're not a danger to themselves, so they can actually function on their own. Um, the officers have to write the report, the officers have to continue the booking process, um, and then ultimately they're given a citation and leaving. Uh, it generally takes about an hour from beginning to end for the officer to book this person, um, and then with all the paperwork on the other end. Besides just the officer's work, now you have records clerks that have to transcribe the reports, then we have to, we have to you know, send the, the citations to court. This is a program where we get somebody, we contact somebody, it's a voluntary basis, and we ask them, do you want to go to a, a sobering station where you get resources? If the answer is yes, we'll take them down here voluntarily. We'll meet at the Sally Port here, we'll give them a, a brief synopsis of what we have, what the person has done. It generally takes about 10 to 15 minutes tops to get them out of our car, into the hands of the people here, and and that's it. You and don't it, have all these reports to write. Correct, and it's easy. We, we will still document the, the, the incident, um, but it's just an easy transition, it's, it's an easy handoff, and at least we know they're not just going to sit somewhere for eight hours. At least we know that, that there's going to be a tent made to to provide resources, and to not cure, but to, to help these people. Tell the viewing point public what a Sally Port is. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry about that. Uh, Sally Port is the, uh, it's basically the, the entrance to the location. It's a secured entrance where we drive our cars in. Um, that's when we're met by the, the Be Well staff there. Um, and, and we do the handoff there. We wouldn't do it in the parking lot in the Oakland open because we do have intoxicated people with us. But it's usually a secured facility where we can, we can do a safe handoff. Sorry about that. Okay. If I could add something Please to you. Officer Ryan's comments, everything that the officer just described with regards to the time it takes law enforcement to interact with the jail system, 
the same thing happens in the emergency departments of hospitals. Uh -huh. And so oftentimes the officers will refer to it as wall time. Oh. And at the hospitals where I oversaw mental health and addiction services for a long time, we'll keep you tied up for a couple of hours. Correct. And so, um, in That's Orange, if there's openings. If there's openings. Yeah. And so in Orange County, there were 50,000 emergency department admissions last year for mental health and substance use mm -hmm. and related issues. Wow. The vast majority of which should not be there. And just like in the jail, they're not getting the care that they deserve. Mm -hmm. And so this is really an effort to solve both of those things. Our, our community is better off not in a jail and not in an ER. So, yeah. so, so it's a tremendous, not only the time saving, but you're opening up slots in your emergency rooms that exactly. you otherwise taken up and a tremendous cost savings for the hospitals. And that's why they're contributing to here. That's right. Among, among the reasons. And in the time of COVID where room, you know, space in a hospital mm -hmm. was at a premium, it was a really special thing, mm -hmm. um, all the more reason. So. Does it make a difference um, for the individual, whether they're brought to the sobering station or kept in the jail in terms of the charge? Uh, if, if they're brought to the sobering station, it, it's not on a criminal matter. So um, that's a bonus benefit yeah, as well. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. um, when, when they go to jail, they're generally given a ticket on, uh, on their way out. And, it, and then they have, a lot of times for their homeless community, when they have that ticket over their head, then it turns into a warrant because a lot of times they don't make right. their court date. And so a simple arrest for being intoxicated public then turns to a series of warrants or a series of court dates, and it, it's, it's not beneficial for anybody. Right. So somebody that's struggling, this is going to help to decriminalize their addiction that they have. So that's Absolutely. really helpful. Thank Absolutely. you. Well, thank you for that, and, and I hope you're enjoying your day off. So thank you for coming here. <laughs> that's my pleasure. <laughs> has tremendous work and the teamwork that's happening here is just incredible. Yeah. So at this time I would uh, invite uh, Supervisor Foley if she would uh, like to introduce Dr. Chow. Great. Well, we all know that we've been through a couple of years here now, I can't believe I'm having to say a couple of years, um, with this COVID crisis. And uh, throughout the COVID crisis, I think we have all worked collectively to try to make sure that people had accurate medical health information so that they could make decisions about their lives and whether that be uh, vaccinations, treatment for COVID, wearing a mask, when to wear a mask, when, when you don't have to wear a mask. And so I want to introduce Dr. Chow to give an update on where we are here in Orange County with the status of our both our vaccinations, uh, the loosening of our restrictions, and how do we get back to living our best lives here in Orange County? Thank you, Supervisor, uh, Supervisor Foley, and thank you, panel, for showcasing the wonderful work being done here at this Be Well facility to support the mental health and recovery of our OC community. Uh, we are going to be talking more about our mental health and how we have been impacted by the COVID-19 um, uh, and how uh, we have been uh, providing support for our community uh, on our uh, HCA bi-weekly talk show, uh, Your Health Matters OC. So please join us on our YouTube or Facebook channels next Tuesday, March 8th at 6 p.m. So let's talk about COVID and what's currently happening in Orange County uh, as well as throughout uh, the, the, the country. Uh, in Orange County, the status about COVID-19 cases and vaccination uh, has improved, uh, I would say, dramatically. Uh, our case rate per 100K as of today is down to 11. Uh, our daily cases count down to about 257. Our positivity rate down to 3.7% hospitalization for adults down to 233 uh, with only 10 uh, children under the age of 18 in the hospital. And our ICU admission is down to 35. Uh, and uh, we only uh, have uh, 35 adults in the ICU. Uh, we no longer, as of this morning, uh, have any children uh, in the ICU bed. So that's very, very good news. As you probably are aware, um, this last search, the Omicron search that we're getting out uh, from, uh, mostly affected children more so than the previous searches that we have. A vaccination rate in uh, Orange County, thank you, Supervisor Foley, for mentioning that that's very important. And we now have achieved 74.5% of individuals who are eligible for the vaccine, which means individual five and older 
who are fully vaccinated. So that's very, very important. But if you talk about overall percentage for all 3.2 million people in Orange County, that number is about 70.2%, which is quite high compared to other states and other area uh, in the country. Um, I'm happy to report that those who qualify for the booster shot or additional shot, as we call it, uh, we now over close to 1.2 million folks who have gotten their booster shots. Uh, our 5 to 11-year-olds, we still need to do some work on that because only 36% of them have seen one dose and only about 29.7% of them are fully vaccinated. So let me repeat, for our children the age of 5 to 11, only a third of them are fully vaccinated. So we really need to move uh, forward. Um, there, there's, there's debates in the community, there's debates in the state, and there's debates in the country. Uh, but clearly science and medicine has already declared that COVID is a childhood disease. Make no mistake, we know that COVID is a childhood disease. Uh, for our uh, age group from 12 to 17, um, happy to report that 72 percent, uh, close to two-thirds of them have seen one dose, uh, with 66 percent of them are fully vaccinated, so that's good. So that age group is more protected than our younger age group. So I, wanted, I would like to encourage our parents out there who are hesitant in making decision to vaccinate their children is really have a conversation with your pediatricians. Uh, go on to the county website, the state website, and the CDC website and learn more about the vaccine in children. Uh, our oldest adult population is the one that you probably heard me talk about last time is I'm most proud of is close to 100% of them have seen one dose. And clearly here in Orange County, almost 93% of them are fully vaccinated. I think that's the reason why if you compare to our surrounding county, and I try not to do that, I think that our metric uh, consistently have been lower is because we have achieved a higher vaccination rate in our most vulnerable population, and that's a senior. Sadly, though, uh, we had a large number of deaths during this past uh, winter uh, Omicron surge, um, totally about, totaling up to about 631 deaths. We know for sure in the month of January we had 487 deaths, uh, and uh, in the month of February, uh, the numbers still keep coming, but uh, as of today, uh, in February, we clock in as 144 deaths. Uh, my heart really go out to the family members of those folks who passed away for this two years of pandemic. And so, Vice Foley, you talk about two years, it seemed like a long time, uh, but it was with a blink in an eye, we are now entering the third year of this pandemic, and we still lose people to the COVID-19 and and clearly a significant number of them are individuals who are not vaccinated, who were not vaccinated, or they were vulnerable folks who are fully vaccinated but did not have a chance to uh, get their booster. I still remind people back to the case of uh, 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 past General uh, Colin Power who fully vaccinated but didn't have a chance to get his booster yet and got COVID and passed away. That was a sad, sad day for our country. I still remind our senior that you, knew, you really need to get uh, the booster shot. And if you are in individual or immunocompromised, the recommendation now is you have to get the fourth dose. I can share with you personally, it took me a month to con health officer of Orange County convince my mom who is elderly and immunocompromised to get her fourth shot and I'm happy to report that she got her fourth shot over the weekend. Uh, we was so relieved, right? I mean, yes, people are tired of COVID, people are tired of the vaccine and get injected, but we really need to educate. Uh, our community, especially those who are vulnerable, that the vaccine still works and the vaccine is the only way out of this pandemic, period. Um, so let's talk about the new CDC guidance for COVID-19. And so as you know, last Friday, the CDC uh, really introduced a new tool to help our communities decide what prevention step to take based on the latest data, right? And so the data are, are collected every day on a daily basis from hospital all over the country. And so these are real data science. And the CDC released a tool to really promote 
uh, making changes to guidance based on real science and based on data. Uh, if you l go on the CDC website, uh, the section that talk about know your community, COVID-19 community level, uh, it talks about how the level are divided up to low, medium, and high. And it is determining by looking at the hospital beds being used in your local jurisdiction by county, um, hospital admissions, and the total number of new COVID cases in an area. Orange County, as of last Friday, um, and uh, we're in the medium risk category, and I would say closer to the, 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 the line that delineate between me medium and low, and I'm hopeful that when the CDC updates its uh, website once a week, uh, this Friday, that we'll probably, most likely, we'll see that the Orange County will be in the low, uh, low level. Um, so that, that is very reassuring for me that we are moving the right directions. Um, uh, having this information really does allow us uh, locally to determine which COVID-19 uh, prevention measure to recommend for our communities at any time, at any uh, uh, given uh, time, uh, and to adjust as needed if we see another outbreak or variance. People kept asking me, so Dr. Chow, will there be another search? Uh, the answer is yes. Uh, knowing the way this uh, virus uh, uh, has been behaving, uh, we know that another surge will come. And people will say, well, how, how high, how strong is that surge? Uh, I would beg you not to look at how high or how strong is the surge, but rather not our health system, the box that we call health system, will our box that we call health system be able to sustain us through the surge? Um, we predicted the Omicron surge, uh, and we we, we talked about how even though the cases and the number of hospitalization might not be as high as the, as the winter surge a year ago, but the health system is smaller, right? And we've seen that. We've seen um, a, pro a lot of people in the emergency room. Uh, we've seen that people are waiting for a hospital bed and what have you. And I think we're out of that surge now, but it doesn't mean that we're completely out of the woods, right? Uh, we all, you, you all heard uh, the governor and uh, secretary of health, uh, Dr. Galley, talk about how we need to learn to live with this virus. Uh, originally, we predict that similar to the the, the, the Spanish flu in the 19, early 1900, uh, it stayed around for a few years. Um, but from what we know, how this coronavirus behaved to now, I think for those of us who are alive now, we're going to have to deal with this virus uh, our lifetime. Um, so there is no way out of this virus at this time uh, based on the science that we know uh, to date. Uh, so with this new CDC metrics and community levels, it does include the recommendation to talk to your health care provider about whether or not you need to wear a mask. Now, this might be confusing to the public since the state of California is still making strong recommendation uh, universally and further reviewing the CDC new guidance trying to uh, um, uh, uh, perhaps adapt to the CDC uh, metrics. So we're waiting for the state to issue the metric for uh, California. But with that said, let's talk about the changes that the state of California has announced yesterday. I know many of you anticipated the change yesterday. Um, the California Department of uh, Human Health Services, Dr. Galley and the governor announced a new mass guidance for California yesterday. So the two changes that occur is this. As of today, March 1st, the universal uh, mandate uh, for mass uh, for indoor uh, for everybody, uh, including people who are unvaccinated, has ended uh, a little bit over midnight last night, right? Uh, before midnight last night, so starting this morning, uh, basically in California and Orange County is following that guidance. That is, uh, when you are indoor in a setting, a specific general setting, uh, you don't have to wear a, a, a mask, um, but uh, it, it, it's not optional. Uh, the, the guidance went from a mandate to a strongly recommended and let me speak to that later on in a few minutes let me finish the two the second announcement so the second announcement from the state is that um, before midnight uh, March 11th so which is next Friday 
um, the uh, universal indoor ma mask mandate for K to 12 and childcare settings uh, will sunset. And so uh, midnight or the morning of Saturday, March 12, uh, the guidance will, will go from a mandate to a strongly recommended. Uh, and I, and I, let, me, let me stress that point. It's not like the mandate go from yes mandate and then the next day no mandate optional. That's not it. The change is from mandate to strongly recommendation. And I interpret it as uh, really the state following our approach. And our approach have always been if you follow uh, Dr. CK and I, um, my uh, deputy health officer, who, by the way, is in the room here. Um, if you follow our um, our um, press release and press conferences and announcement uh, way since last last year, we have been uh, really educating and supporting and encourage a resident in Orange County to know your risk, know your own risk, know the risk of individuals who live with you or stay with you to assess whether or not you need to use a mask. I will still say whether or not you're indoor or outdoor, if you're in an area with people that you don't know, especially now if you don't know their vaccination status, put on a mask. Know your risk, put on a mask because it is a strongly recommendation, okay? Please be clear that while the mandate has changed, again, strong recommendation, need to follow, and we hope that we can count on you, each one of you, to help support your loved one our community to keep them safe because we still live with the virus. We're not out of the woods yet. So we mask for the protections of the vulnerable population. And who are they? Again, children who are currently not eligible for the vaccine yet. Children under the age of five. People who are disabled. People who are 65 years or older. People with compromised immune system or with chronic condition. And some of you might ask me, well, what, is, what are the chronic, uh, chronic kind of medical condition? You can go on the CDC website and search for chronic health condition, and, this, and the CDC has just updated their list of what are those chronic health conditions, and so you can gauge for yourself, okay? Now, with those two announcements from the state, let me make it very clear that there are still settings that need to have uh, the uh, indoor... Um, universal mass mandate for everybody, staff and client, regardless of your vaccination uh, status, is because these are the hybrid settings. They are healthcare. So early on, Marshall tell you that even, even though this is a healthcare facility, but we are not wearing masks indoor because this section of this facility has its own entrance. Clients, patients don't cross over, so they are off limits, and that's why this section of this building uh, is considered the general public building. So it's not a health care uh, segment uh, or section of the building. Uh, so health care setting, inpatient, outpatient, skilled nursing facility, et cetera. Okay? Uh, correctional setting like jail and prison, homeless shelters, emergency shelters, cooling center, et cetera, and Public transit, now that's very important. If you are in the bus station, train station, or the airport, uh, or on those, uh, uh, in the, uh, what do they call that? They call a, uh, a hub, or you, uh, well, you're actually on the uh, transport vehicle, and you still have to wear a mask because it is a federal mandate. It's not a state mandate. All right, so somebody would ask about mega events. Let me finish that. Uh, Molly to signal me to speed it up. Uh, effective March 1st today, masking will move to strong recommendation. Also, uh, for any mega event defined at 1,000 people indoor or 10,000 people outdoor, even though mass is, is strongly recommended, but proof of either vaccination or a negative test will remain as a requirement. Let me make that very clear. So proof that you are either vaccinated or you have a negative test uh, will remain as a requirement in the mega event. Finally, let me echo Dr. Galley's sentiments on his, in his press announcement yesterday. We're living in challenging time, as Supervisor Foley uh, mentioned earlier, uh, you know, two years. Gosh, 
we're going on year three now, right? So there's, it is a confusion time, but it's an exciting time. It is a time for us to really uh, re-energize, to help each other, to care for each other, uh, to uh, get our economy into the recovery and get people work, get people services, mental health services, physical, uh, physical health services at the right time, at the right place, which you know Orange County is at the forefront of doing that compared to other area. Uh, in the state, if not in the country. So please, be kind to each other, be accepting of each other, be respectful towards each other, and be safe. So with that, thank you. I will turn it back to Chairman Chaffee for Q&A. Dr. Chuck, can I ask a question yes, about schools? So will you be monit will the health care agency be monitoring in case there is like an outbreak in a particular school setting so that maybe they'll need to go back to wearing masks for a period of time? We all know how hard it is for the young people to wear the mask and how it's been a real struggle. And we want to make sure that we allow them to be able to be maskless uh, where it's safe. But will you be monitoring? Yes, ma'am. That's a great question. I think I alluded to the state will be coming up with a metric for our local uh, uh, health care agency and our local jurisdiction to follow as when to off-ramp the, ma the mask and when to on-ramp the mask, okay. right, based on those metrics. So we're waiting for the state to release California metrics. But secondly, the health care agency will continue to work very closely with the school district, public, and as well as private school, charter school, and our Orange County Department of Education to help school to handle should they have an outbreak or cluster cases. So, yes, uh, you're still going to have to pay for my staff to do that kind of work. So thank you for your support, both Supervisor Foley and Chairman uh, Chafee, in really in, uh, uh, pushing us to work closely with our educational partners. So thank you. Thank you. Chairman. Yes. Thank you, Dr. Chow. Uh, at this time, we'll take questions from the media. Operator, can you please open up the line? Certainly, thank you. And to ask a question, please press one and then zero on your telephone feedback. First, we'll go to the line of Nick Gerda with the voice of full speed. Please go ahead. Can you hear me okay? Yes, we can. Thank you. Oh, perfect, perfect. I had a uh, what's that? Uh, continue to store you here. You're starting to break up, sorry. Okay, uh, there might be some echo on. Yes, go ahead and speak, Nick, please. Thank you. Um, yeah, so on homeless deaths, now a few weeks ago, to take um, I'm wondering if there's no general. Nick, you're cutting up. Operator, is the line okay then for, for reporters? Currently, we're getting that echo back that we had before. Okay. Nick, can you try again, please? Sure. Can you hear me okay now? We can. Okay. And just a heads up, I'm hearing my... We're having a little bit of an um, echo, but we're going to try to have to work through it. So if you do have the speaker on anywhere else, can you turn down that speaker, too, if you're listening to the feed elsewhere? Yeah, it's just it's just uh, holding my phone up by ear right now. Okay. Let's try again. Okay. So on uh, homeless deaths, um, and we've seen them continue to soar year to year. There was an initiative announced a few weeks ago to examine what's driving that. I'm uh, wondering why there's no answers yet on what you're seeing. It only took us a few minutes a few years ago to see what the biggest increase is been in the types of deaths, whether that's overdoses, homicides, et cetera. Are you able to talk about what you're seeing so far? And if no, why not? Uh, and then secondly, on Be Well, uh, there's been tens of millions of public dollars invested, another $40 million in COVID dollars for the second campus. Uh, we're interested in some numbers on uh, the results and then the outcomes so far. How many people have been treated um, thus far? What for? What have the outcomes been by the numbers? Is that going to be published uh, publicly anywhere? And also for patients who don't have shelter and housing, um, where do they go after Be Well? How many homeless people have gotten housing and shelter after Be Well? And how many haven't? And what efforts are being made on that front? That's a lot to unpack. So the first <laughs> question is related to homeless deaths. Does anybody wish to ask uh, answer the question related to homeless deaths? Or if we have anybody here, they can. We just finalized the uh, 
the data with the coroner's office. Why don't you come okay. up to the podium? Yeah. Let's have you go to the podium, yeah. Dr. Chow. Dr. Chow. I did thank you for that question. As I mentioned last time we had it, we are finalizing the data with the cor uh, coroner's office, uh, and then we will we, we'll be releasing that. So uh, be on the lookout for that, okay? okay? And the next question is regarding funding related to Be Well. Yeah, I can probably answer that question um, if you'd like. Sure, please. Um, I appreciate the question very much. Um, you know, we talked about at the beginning of this conversation, Orange County is known for world-class health care. Um, across the spectrum. And so um, for those of us who are boots on the ground mental health and have been doing this for a career, it's a terrific uh, point of encouragement that we're starting to make the same investments in mental health and substance use care that we have long invested uh, in the other parts of health care. And so uh, it's tremendous and we're starting to see an impact. I think Nick uh, asked the question about how many people have been treated here to date. Uh, the campus opened at the end of last January, so it's been about a year, because of COVID, we were very conscientious in phasing the opening of the campus. And so it wasn't fully operational until the end of May. And since that time, we have seen pushing upwards of about 4,000 people. Um, many of those came by way of law enforcement or through emergency departments who would have otherwise been in jails or uh, ERs for long-term stays. And so um, we're really uh, encouraged by the results. Uh, a lot more to do uh, between Dr. Kelly and myself on data specifics. Um, and yes, at some point, Nick, uh, we will be far enough along to be able to publish that data and be quite transparent with the community about what's happening here. Yes, thank you. So uh, we do have a reporter in the room um, with Los Alamitos TV that'd like to ask a question. Yeah. I actually have two very quick questions, one for Marshall Moncrief and one for the lieutenant from Fullerton. Uh, for, for you, Mr. Moncrief, at Be Well, is a mental health diagnosis essentially a prerequisite for entry into the Be Well? In other words, does one have to have some aspect of a mental health diagnosis to enter here? Could one simply be, uh, you know, f entered for addiction? And would you consider addiction mental health diagnosis? And then I have a question for the lieutenant. Okay, a great question. And so um, to answer the second one first, yes, we absolutely consider substance use disorders um, a mental health challenge and a mental health disorder, uh, for sure. And to answer your first question, uh, no, nobody needs a diagnosis specifically or a referral necessarily from a psychiatrist to enter treatment here. For example, um, the officer and, and officers all of Orange County are bringing people in based on what they're seeing and experiencing without diving in deep, trying to diagnose a person onto whether or not they ought to bring them in the front door. And that is my, leads me to my second question for Lieutenant Hines. Uh, you are head of the uh, Homeless Liaison Task Force in Fullerton. Yes, sir. And you're also the um, uh, lead uh, uh, officer in your SWAT team. Yes, sir. Are you able to remand individuals on, from the street or any particular public location to the Be Well Foundation with or without medical assistance? And can you also 5150 an individual without the assistance of medical staff specifically to assist you? Let, let me get, let me clarify the question. Can we can we take somebody here? Can we detain somebody and take somebody here without a medical supervision, I guess, is the yes. question? Absolutely. If, if they fit the uh, criteria, and this is in the public, if they're a danger to themselves, other, or they're grade with disabled, um, we have the ability to, to take them into our protective custody and transport them. Uh, and that, we will then hand them over to the medical clinicians here. And that includes uh, an action that we commonly refer to as 5150? Absolutely. That's exactly what I'm referring to. Thank you. Yes, sir. We can go back to the phone lines for our next question. Thank you. I'm Grandpa Warren. We'll go to Norberto and Anna with a voice proposal. Yeah, can you guys hear me okay? We can hear you, yeah. Norberto. You might have a little bit of feedback, but go ahead and Great. just ask your question. Got it. Thank you again for uh, taking questions. I would put just a few out. Um, on the hospitalization and ICU numbers for COVID, 
Do you have any specifics on who is being hospitalized? Uh, do they have other conditions? Do, are they coming from nursing homes? Do we know anything about people? This is kind of details we've been asking for two years going. Do you keep any sort of specifics on that? Um, and also, you mentioned that our metrics are better than other counties. Do you think that you'll, at some point, do your dashboard in a way that is a little bit more public friendly and easier to digest the numbers and also put them in context? Because I think that's a statement that could be questioned about death rate, vaccinations. It would be great to see how we are doing, you know, compared to other counties and be able to gauge what's working, what's not working, what could we adjust on. So just for you, Dr. Chow, any sense of as we move into this new chapter of COVID from a reporting standpoint, uh, do you see yourself you know, making adjustments how you're sharing that? Thank you, Nabardo. And, and uh, Nabardo, we'll go ahead and answer that question, and then we'll come back to the next question in the queue. Thank you. Thank you, Nabardo, for that question. And actually, that question is very timely. Uh, currently, there's a conversation statewide on not only the state dashboard, but also the local health jurisdiction dashboard as well. Um, the state is, uh, has not settled on uh, how frequently and what are the measures that the state will put on the state dashboard. And then the state also has not settled on whether or not recommending the local uh, jurisdiction to um, pretty much sunset the local jurisdiction dashboard. As you know, we talk about this. Uh, the dashboard take a lot of human resources to scrub the data because the data that we get is from the the state and it's not clean, right? And usually it's cumulative data that my staff have to scrub. Uh, as time go on, more people are in that dash, uh, the, the dashboard from the state for us to pull the data from, uh, the, the longer time for us to scrub the data. So I've already begun the conversation with my own staff, uh, my uh, epidemiologist team as, as well as the data team on uh, what data moving forward uh, will we be showing on, on our own dashboard uh, should the state make changes in the state uh, uh, dashboard and make recommendations to the local health jurisdiction dashboard. So actually you just give me an idea, probably what we ought to do is pull from all of you, uh, the reporters from media uh, to uh, uh, tell us uh, what data point will be important uh, for you to, uh, to see on a regular basis, and when I say regular here, is that we we'll probably would settle with the frequency that would match with the state frequency. So uh, thank you for giving that, me that idea. So be on the lookout for a survey that we'll probably push out, uh, push out through uh, Molly, our PIO. And as is related to the uh, data for the hospitalization, what we know is currently very consistent throughout this search is that about 86% of the individual or plus 86% of individuals in the hospital who are hospitalized are individuals uh, who are unvaccinated, so it continues to be so. And then those who are vaccinated, a majority of them, um, if not almost all, or individuals who have chronic health condition or individuals who are immunocompromised that have not had a chance to get the booster yet. And that's why you've heard me keep stressing the fact that if, if you are eligible for the booster and if you are individual with high risk, please get vaccinated. So thank you. I have a follow-up. I think the question is a good one as it relates to why don't we have that data on our dashboard? The what? data about the number of people who are not vaccinated who we are do hospitalized. Have that. We do have that. We do have, a, we do have a okay. graph on who's in the hospital, and the, the line will tell you who are vaccinated versus who are not vaccinated. We do have that. Okay, great. Thank you, ma'am. I think we have time for one more question. Yeah, just one more. Yeah. Operator, any questions? Okay. It looks like we have a follow-up from Roberto Santana. Go ahead. Thanks, Roberto, for going back in queue. Yeah, I appreciate you guys allowing me to follow up. For the Be Well people, more specific on 4,000 people service, how were picked up on at our home? How many of them are covered? I'm unclear if of this is geared for the street population. How much of this is more private insurance that it, I use? And for the county, question for you. 
the virus issues involving how said we'll be living. Have you looked at anything in the department to consider things like outdoor dining, office uh, buildings, air circulation systems that being indicate yourself leading front working with three and up to uh, format public to make them as possible as they so to, to summarize, because we have a little bit of an echo in here too, the first question is in regard to the Bewell population. Is it more of a street kind of population that comes in here? What is the kind of mix as, as far as that population is concerned? And then we'll go to the next question after that. Yeah, thanks very much for that question. We talked earlier about Bewell being more than a facility. I will answer your question respect of, of, of this facility, but, but it applies to everything that we're doing as a community under Bewell. And so um, this, the services here are for the entire community. That includes people who are struggling with homelessness and may be unsheltered. It also includes people who are sheltered, um, actively working in their community, and across payer types. So far, within the first year of this campus, most of the patient population has been Medicaid covered. Um, most of them have been sheltered. We have a, a little bit shy of probably 15% uh, who have been unsheltered. Uh, but this is open for the community regardless of your status. And then the secondary question is in regard to for the supervisors as far as payment and such is concerned. I, uh, Roberto, I apologize. We were having some uh, technical difficulties in hearing you. Um, if we can't answer that question right now because we couldn't hear you completely, we can do a follow-up um, after that with you. I'll repeat what I thought he said. You got it. Well, I, I think the question was, uh, what are we going to do as supervisors to assist with outdoor dining and transformation of our public facilities to make sure that people have more space and more ability to be outside? Um, I think that was your question. We only heard bits and pieces of it. Is that accurate, Nabrito? Yeah, that's correct. Okay. So, Mr. Chairman, did you want to go first? Oh, um. Well, we have multiple jurisdictions there. Cities are going to have the jurisdiction over their own restaurants, and we're only able to have jurisdiction over our county territories. Uh, so uh, we do have a health care inspection system that checks on restaurants and, and that sort of thing. And so if it's outdoors as well as indoors, we have more area to inspect. Uh, so uh, the uh, public loves, I think, outdoor dining, and we're fortunate to have the good weather here versus other places that have snow. Uh, so I, what I've found from uh, the cities that I work with, they want to keep uh, the uh, outdoor dining open, and they've set aside some special areas just to do that. Uh, and so, uh, but we don't. I don't think we have anything under our county territory. I can't think of one where we have that. Uh, so we like to also comment on the homelessness issues. Uh, our mental health facilities are as. Uh, Marshall Moncrief pointed out, open for everyone. Uh, it sometimes it's difficult for um, our homeless population to get to where they need to be to get the care they need. And so I know we're going to be initiating a street care uh, medical uh, situation coming out of Cal Optima in the near future where we will go to the uh, individuals on the street to see what care they need. Uh, that sometimes it's difficult for a homeless person to uh, find the ability to go to a place, or even if they do, they don't like leave their possessions outside where their fear of them being stolen while they get the care they need. So we're intending to go more to them on the street. That's what we call street uh, care, street medicine, and that will be coming out as soon as we can uh, make that happen. I think by the end of this month, I think we'll have uh, some effort going out there. Uh, it's, it's overdue, I'll simply say that. So we're going to keep pushing on it until we get that done. And that the care there includes mental health as well and uh, drug uh, usage type things, not, not just the physical well-being. We are concerned about the number of uh, deaths that occur, the mortality rate among our homeless population on the street, and we hope to have an answer to at least mitigate that some. So I don't know if I covered the question. Maybe I went overboard, but that's kind of it. And uh, so if you have other questions, if you please uh, put us. I'm going to respond go ahead. to his question, too. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, so, um, you know, I, I began the pandemic as the mayor of Costa Mesa, and then uh, we're 
I don't think we're ending the pandemic, but at this phase in the pandemic as a supervisor, and I will tell you that the mayors of the county of Orange have been very supportive in the city councils in uh, enabling restaurateurs to be able to go outside, uh, loosening up the zoning so that they can go outside, reducing parking requirements. But how does the county have any role in that? The county's role in uh, that is going to be related to how do we create more active transportation? How do we create more walkable communities from the county perspective? And that's how we'll be able to help when everyone gets back to normal and more people are going out to restaurants and we start to have a parking problem, right? So I, uh, for one, very much support us doing the outdoor dining. I think it's really been uh, perfect for allowing businesses to stay open. As our county facilities are built, we're going to be building them with COVID in mind. Uh, the new facilities will have better ventilation systems. The new facilities will anticipate that we might have a surge. So I know that that's gonna to be top of mind for all the planners and the healthcare agency as we start to build these new facilities. We're gonna be building facilities. We're in the middle of building a facility right now at the Hall of Administration. We've got master plans in the works. And we do have county uh, leases that we operate for uh, our beaches and the dunes and different parks. And so we will have to keep in mind, uh, how do we create a, a culture and an experience where we can continue to operate if we have a surge in COVID? Because we don't want to have shutdowns like we've had in the past. Uh, thank you, Supervisor Foley. I believe that concludes our questions. If there are questions uh, beyond this, if you would please submit them to us uh, in writing, and we'll do our best to get back to you with the appropriate personnel responding with the knowledge that is uh, important to answer the question. That concludes our press conference. Uh, this is the OC press conference. We'll be moving around the county as best we can. There's some great things here we want to highlight. We are the OC. We are, we think, the very best county in the nation for all the things we have going here, and we're going to highlight that as we go forward. So thank you all for coming here this afternoon. Thank you. Thank you.